anger has turned to fury here. An entire people facing persecution. Today they set fires and protest, crowding around to tell us of ISIS' bloodthirsty reign. They kidnapped women and of how the jihadists killed. They shot, they shot them and then they cut their heads off. ISIS is well armed, but sheer terror may be their most powerful weapon. Crucifixions shared with the world on social media. Men marched to their deaths. It is fair to say a good segment of America is tired of hearing the words Iraq, war, and what can anyone with a working brain cell do next to fix or save a country that apparently has little desire to save itself. We cannot run from it, we cannot hide from it, and we cannot ignore the various tribes and factions that have made peace there, to this point, completely impossible. Welcome into Midpoint. Formerly with the Department of Defense and State Department, he spent five years in Iraq overseeing more than $1 billion in U.S. development. He knows the lay of the land and the people. Shaq Shackelford joins the fray. Shaq, thanks so much for being here today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Shaq, let me ask you a very blunt question right up front. With everything that we are seeing here right now that's happening in Iraq, why not just let this country fade, fail, and take care of it on their own? Well, that's a great question. However, the problem that we would have if we took that course is that sooner or later the extremists and the terrorists that are committing the murders that they're doing and the genocide that's going on there now would be flowing into this country. In fact, there are some folks speculating that some have already flown in through our southern, southern borders. But uh, that's just not a reasonable course of action when genocide is ongoing anywhere in the world uh, for the United States of America to, to back out of it and be on the sideline. I don't know if a lot of people will see it as backing out. What a lot of people I think in America will see, Shaq, and certainly you can lend some credence to this and also some fact behind it is, we've been there before. We've tried. We've done everything possible. We've spent billions. We've shed blood on that sand. And no matter what we do, the people there do not seem to have either the resolve, the desire, the wherewithal to protect themselves. And I think that's where that weariness comes from. So it's not so much backing out, but wouldn't you agree that there's just that philosophy that maybe we just let them sort itself out for 10 or 20 years and then figure out what happens from there. I know it sounds pretty simplistic, but that's the way a lot of people think. And, and understandably, uh, the fact of the matter is, I believe it was Albert Einstein, he said, if you continue to do something and expect different results and it doesn't happen, that's a form of insanity. And what we've been doing in Iraq has basically been the same thing over and over again. And we have had failure. Part of that failure has come from the standpoint that we have not had the relationship uh, or the access or the influence that we need to have with the Iraqi leadership. When we pulled back uh, at, in December of 2011, there were many, many people saying, you know, we'll be back over there in short order. And unfortunately, that has been a prediction that has come true. There's a great deal of difference between the Arabs and the Kurds. Uh, the Kurds have a sense of nationalism that others don't have, and it's basically because somebody's been trying to kill them for the last 500 years. They are, they are nationalist first, and they are very permissive in their religious tolerance. In Kurdistan, you can see Christians and, and Muslims living side by side or across the street from each other and been getting along with each other for uh, many, many, many decades. You don't have that in other parts of Iraq. Was it then, to use your own words, insanity, that this government and other governments, but more specifically the United States, did not get behind the Kurds from the very first to do everything they could to help them succeed and to use them, although we have at times, but to do a better job of using them as the focal point in order to try and get this country under some kind of control. It, that's exactly right. The, the fact of the matter is there is a big difference between an ally and a partner. And the Kurds have been a partner to the United States for a long time. 
the fact of the matter is the Al Maliki administration for the last eight years has ignored the northern part of Iraq. They ignored Mosul, they ignored the Kurds. For instance, there's a dispute between Baghdad and Erbil over Erbil's ability to sell oil that comes out of its own land. There's a tanker right now in Galveston Bay that uh, the, the Iraqis are suing the Kurds in U.S. court over, plus the fact Baghdad has withheld their share, of the Kurds' share of oil revenues now for seven months, and that totals $7 billion, B with a billion. It's a billion dollars a month, first of uh, September to be eight. So the fact of the matter is there have been many things done wrong, but we have to look internally as well at our own approach. We have ignored Syria. We, we've had a three-year problem there and have just ignored, just stood back. And we thought that containment would be the policy and that we could to contain the terrorist and extremist in Syria. That has failed because they've gone now into Iraq. If we don't contain it at some point in the near future, then it's going to spread into Jordan, Turkey, and all of the other areas around Iraq. And the Kurds have been the ones that have been sick all the time, right there with us, helped us, and been our partner. Not just an ally, but a partner. Shaq, the, looking at some in insanity here and some mistakes indeed that the Americans might have made, do you find it just a little too convenient that it really wasn't until ISIS came up on Erbil, you mentioned those, you mentioned that city just a few minutes ago, this is a boom town, Chevron, Exxon Mobil are there, the big oil companies, and all of a sudden you get close to Erbil, the administration starts to take notice because, again, it seems to be all about the oil. Well, lots of folks will say that we have been involved in picking winners and losers, and I believe that has gone on, and unfortunately in the Middle East we have picked more losers than we have winners. What we need is a different approach through our State Department. Their approach to these issues has been diplomacy must take its own course at its own time. That is a great mantra for not being results focused. Department of Defense, on the other hand, is as, is as results focused as you can get in the United States government. And there's got to be a balance. I'm not saying that there is only a military solution because that's not the case. But our government officials have got to reassess the foreign policy and try to establish what our strategic interests are. Shaq, I'm going to go back to the word insanity you used a moment ago. I hate to interrupt, but you're, you're hitting on a point here right now. You just said that we have this great habit of picking losers. You were in the State Department. Why can we not be smarter? Why are we continually, and I'm, I'm going to use some very frank words here, just so incredibly stupid as far as the rest of the world sees us that we can't pick the winners and that we continue to pick the losers? Ed, there, there, there are a number of reasons behind uh, what you just said that make it true, but the biggest part is is experience. Yes, our State Department have got some wonderful and smart senior foreign service officers and junior foreign service officers that are putting it on the line every day. But until Iraq, the mantra in the State Department was when the first shots rang out, you pull down the colors and the Marine security guards evacuate the embassy. And the embassy didn't come back until it was safe and secure. That was not the case in Iraq, and it was not the case in Afghanistan. It, the, the State Department needs more time to work through some of their own internal issues and they have had a huge change in the way diplomacy is approached by being in conflict zones. 
most of the State Department people don't want to be there. And former Secretary of State Rice ran into that problem. She was sued by the Foreign Service Officers Association when she was uh, attempting to make the best of the best go. Uh, the best of the best of the Foreign Service Officers go because most of them did not want to go into these conflict areas. It's not what they've been used to. It's not what they've been trained for. Shaq, I've only got about 30 seconds left here, so let me ask you, with your experience, knowing the region, knowing the State Department, knowing the Department of Defense, should we simply just let this country break apart at this point? Should we let them fractionalize and get to those different regions that will change the face of the country forever? Absolutely not, Ed, because I am convinced that if we take that course of action, then I will be defending my homeland right here in North Carolina against some extremist that I've never heard of. ISIS is well organized, well funded, and from so what I've seen, many of those people have had some form of war college training. We need to find out where the money is coming from and sever the money flows. And I understand that a lot of the money may be coming out of Qatar and, uh, excuse me, Qatar and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. We have got to stop the money flow to these people. And we're going to have to stop it there, unfortunately, because we are all sure. out of time. Shaq, thank you so much for some excellent and very frank comments. We'll talk to you again very soon. Okay, Ed, take care. Thanks right. a lot. Thank you very much. Stay with us. Midpoint continues.